Hi, everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. On an average summer day, post rainstorm, you'll see flooded streets in Miami Beach and other parts of low lying South Florida. Sea level rise is something many of my clients think about down here in Florida, which makes sense with our 1,350 mile coastline. Many coastal communities are in the process of repairing and upgrading seawalls due to requirements imposed by local ordinances and having to levy large special assessments to do so. One of my guests today, Professor Harold, or Hale Wanless, co-authored an article that begins, it's been happening so slowly that most of us are missing what may become the most awesome display of the century. Sea level is rising. What might surprise you is that he wrote that article in 1981. Professor Wanless is the chair of the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Miami's College of Arts and Sciences. He has been writing and talking about climate change and sea level rise for more than three decades. In addition to being an advocate on climate change, in 2011, Professor Wanless founded the Advanced Climate Leadership Training Series, Empowering Capable Climate Communicators. The event has been held annually ever since. My other guest today is Dr. Esper Andaraglu who is an associate professor of practice in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering with a secondary appointment at the School of Architecture. He is a registered professional engineer and a lead AP accredited educator with an academic focus on building environmental systems, water resources, and sustainability areas. His research area of interest is aimed at development of engineered solutions related to smart water energy infrastructures in response to climate change challenges in urban community settings. He is currently engaged in a U-Link research project, which focuses on the development of the next generation of coastal structures in response to climate change. So Professor Wallace and Professor Andaraglu, welcome to take it to the board. Thank you. Thank you, pleasure being here. So Professor Wallace, let me start with you. What are the latest projections for sea level rise in Florida? And is there a big difference between the projections for Florida and other coastal areas in the United States? Well, that's a difficult question to answer very shortly because there's so many different hypotheses or projections put out. The UN's uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has a ridiculously low projection for this century. It's less than a meter of farther global sea level rise. But they really ignore what's happening in Antarctica and Greenland, which is a rapid acceleration of ice melt, which equals a rapid acceleration of sea level rise. The United States government has projections that vary from um, a couple feet this century up to six feet or maybe 8.2 feet. And that's better, but it's still not realistic. The, The problem with all the current projections are they haven't taken into account how sea level rose out of our last ice age. If we go back 18,000 years in the middle of the last ice age, sea level was down about 428 feet. All our continental shelves were exposed. The North Sea didn't exist. That was connected to the mainland. The way we went from minus 400 and some feet up to the present wasn't just a gradual increase speeding up and slowing down as ice melted from North America and in Asia and so on. It was a series of discrete pulses as some ice sheet sector suddenly disintegrated. And these sudden pulses are from a meter, three feet or so, up to over 10 meters, over 30 feet, probably within a century, these pulses of rise. And the point is, the whole way from when it was small rises to when it was big pulses were all related to this rapid disintegration of ice. When ice starts to melt, it goes very fast. And um, Jim Hansen and some of our other great climatologists understand this, but most of the forecast projections don't have this concept in. And beginning in about 1993, because of a warming atmosphere and a warming ocean, because of our, our burning of fossil fuels and putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we have seen the beginning since the mid-90s of a beginning of ice melt on both Greenland and Antarctica which is adding to the ocean, and a warming of the ocean because of warming of the ocean. You mentioned two U.S. models. You said one was better than the other, but 
better is a relative term. You meant more accurate because the one that you referred to as better actually shows the sea levels rising more rapidly. Is that correct? Well, it, it included a little more about ice, ice acceleration, ice melt acceleration. The problem with those is that they, they do not capture what we have created in terms of the unbelievable amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. If I can just take another minute, if we go back for the last million years, because of how Earth presented herself to the sun, we had at about 100,000 year intervals a more circular and a more oval orbit. And at about 100,000 year intervals, in concert with that, we saw cooling into ice ages and warming into interglacial periods, up and down, up and down. CO2 was going from about 180 parts per million in the cold parts up to about 280 in the warm parts, up and down, up and down. And in concert with that, sea level was going up and down a little over 100 meters. It's just is is a, a beautiful story of how these cycles and how we present ourselves to the sun affect sea level and warming and cooling. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have gone from about 280 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere up to 380 to now we're at 420. We've much more than doubled what drove over 100 meters sea level rise. It's huge. And to think that when you see that graph, to think that, well, maybe we'll have a foot or two of sea level rise. And when you combine that with the understanding that when the only guidance we have to how this works is looking at the past 18,000 years that when ice starts to melt it, it just goes very rapidly. So probably both the earlier projections I put out are severely low. And there's a good chance the higher projections from the U.S. government are suggesting we might be at another two feet by mid-century. I should say at the outset, I'm a community association attorney. I make, I, I do not profess to be a scientist, which is why I'm so delighted to have both you and Professor Andaraglu on the episode today. You mentioned these cycles up and down. The sea level was, was much lower thousands of years ago. Now it's higher or it's vice versa. Can we expect those cycles of up and down to continue? Or are you saying that because of human impact, we're not as likely to see water refreezing. In other words, the ice that we're losing in Greenland, I think you mentioned Greenland, I think you mentioned Antarctica. Is there a chance that we're going to see the um, water actually refreeze in those locations? And the, the ice sheets grow? No. We have overwhelmed it since about 1950. The, the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gases we have forced into the atmosphere we have overwhelmed the natural system completely now. It's a very dramatic thing. And the problem is that carbon dioxide, every time you go to the grocery store in your fuel-burning car, all that CO2 you spit out the back end is going to stay in the atmosphere for three or 4,000 years. And so we have created this huge monster, if you want, of, of excess greenhouse gases. And by that has warmed the atmosphere the other thing is that over 90% of the greenhouse gas heat, the heat produced by the greenhouse gases capturing the back radiation from the sun, over 90% of that extra heat because of our extra greenhouse gases is transferred to the ocean. And we are warming our ocean. And, and that is, you know, if we weren't doing that, it would be easy. You stop burning CO2, you start pulling it out, and it's over. No, we're heating the ocean. And we've hit, heated not just the shallow few meters, several thousand meters are heating up. And so we've really created this, this vast long-term monster of extra heat. And that is expanding the ocean as it warms. And it's also has started beginning in really in the mid-90s. It's the beginning of this, this melting of ice because of both a warmed atmosphere attacking the ice from the top and warmed ocean water coming in from below under the outlet fields. So we hear a lot about carbon offsets. I know that's a real big marketing messaging point these days. You can offset your carbon output. If we stopped carbon emissions today, would that reverse or at least halt the warming of the ocean? No, because... The carbon dioxide that's up in the atmosphere now is going to stay for several thousand years. And climate scientists say that if we stop right now burning fossil fuels and so on, that maybe within 10 to 30 years, the atmosphere will 
reach a, a temperature that it's in equilibrium with the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But that's going to keep transferring almost all its heat to the ocean and keep maintaining a warmth in the atmosphere. So we're going to spend hundreds of years of transferring heat and keep warming the oceans. So we've gotten this cycle going or this sequence going that's not going to turn around for thousands of years, basically. And so, yes, we have to stop using fossil fuels. Yes, we have to start pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but we have to do a lot of that before we might start to reverse the ocean. And in the meantime, we've just created this huge thing. The point of the sea level story is that with what we understand from these pulses of rise and the extreme levels of CO2, that we're probably going to be in for a 10, 20 meters of rise, 60, 70 feet of rise. And the question is, how fast? Well, what we know from the past, even the high-end models from the U.S. government suggest that we might be at two feet by mid-century. We could be at two feet where the sea level rise by with ex- greater acceleration than what's being projected. Three feet by 20 feet at 50, we could be at six feet within 50 years. That's not at all unlikely. And when you think about, if I'm in Miami-Dade County, 3% of our county is greater than 12 feet above sea level. When you think of that and many other counties and coastal areas that are low and vulnerable all over the world, these are absolutely frightful numbers. Well, for sure. And and with that bleak picture, let me turn to you, Professor Andiraglu. We have millions and millions of people living along the coastline, not just in Florida, around the entire United States, and you know, billions of people living around coastlines around the world. So we can't all jet off the planet right now. We have to come up with some solutions. You are my seawall expert today. I, I kind of wanted to start out broad picture. Do you know when the first seawall was created. And I, I have a feeling you're going to tell me whenever people first lived on the coastline, but, but who created seawalls? So seawalls are not a new solution to, as we're discussing in the context of sea level rise today, uh, actually the oldest known seawall uh, is located off the coast of northern Israel, which has been carbon dated to over 7,000 years ago. So it is a, been in use for, you know, thousands of years now. And within the United States alone, we have over 14,000 kilometers of coastline that are uh, protected by from erosion control and flooding with seawalls. How does a seawall act to protect in the most basic terms? Well, in the most basic term really is, as, as, as I just mentioned, erosion control. So it's kind of creates a barrier between the land and the sea. So it, uh, often it prevents the land from caving into sea, fighting off the wave energy that comes off uh, from in this event, and that's its main protection. So, and, and therefore, the barrier is a rigid line. And then traditionally, you know, various materials have been used, like wood, rocks, boulders, metal, various types of steel, uh, wall systems exist today. Uh, and then, of course, uh, cement uh, and concrete are used to armor and to, to kind of defend uh, against uh, this coastal erosion or protection. But as we understand, you know, that basic understanding of their function originally, that as the erosion of protection from erosion, to the impacts we're experiencing today, so today we look at seawalls and we really want to see them not only to protect us from flooding and erosion, but at the same time also prevent environmental pollution, like stormwater runoff, for example, from land into bodies of water, from marine ecology perspective, how they may contribute to uh, marine habitat on the water side, and at the same time, Understanding that 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast, or, or we could also say 3 billion people actually live within 60 kilometer worldwide. Us, you know, humans, we're drawn to water. So we want that access to water. So seawalls also often uh, really unintentionally in the past, but today intentionally provide a social function 
for the residents or the community. Well, it was trade routes too, wasn't it, Professor? Of course. That, I mean, that yeah, early civilizations moved towards the water because that was the way they established their trade routes. Exactly, from between sea railroads and absolutely. So, so various functions, uh, but often you know traditionally they're understood as erosion control barriers. But today. I was in a meeting earlier today, actually, with Broward County, one of the commissioner members and some citizens from Broward County. And, you know, there were various topics along this, you know, that we touched on. And even the construction materials used in seawalls were somewhat discussed because some of the new materials, for example, PVC lined steel panels are now found to be durable and easy to install, but yet adversely impacting the marine ecology because they don't promote any kind of biodiversity or habitat development along the uh, the walls. Uh, so there's a lot of work ahead of us to better understand and create better functions that are, are responsive to these challenges uh, through the use of seawalls. But as we just heard Professor Wong will say we cannot underestimate how potentially high sea level is going to rise. That being said, I imagine as the waters go up, the sea walls have to get higher, correct? Correct. Can't we potentially be living in, in a bathtub? Walls are so high, we feel like we are in a bathtub. That's a good an- analogy, but um, you know, geographic parameters from region to region vary quite a bit. And if we were to take our region, for example... South Florida, the bathtub concept doesn't necessarily work for us because of our geology. We are sitting on highly porous lime rock. So even if we build the walls and create the bathtub, water is still going to rise from ground up, filling that tub. So therefore, the solutions that we need to produce is not really one for all type approaches. So in some ways, they have to be very prescriptive and unique to your geographic location and often may involve a combination of responses. Uh, That bathtub analogy may work in another region, but perhaps not going to work for us in South Florida because of our geology. Uh, But yet there could be certain type of operations assemblies. And I'm going to give you one example uh, of that as, let's say, our wastewater treatment plants. They're primarily all located along the coastline because of their function. That's what they were intended and designed originally, but they're under threat today. Now, is it possible to create that bathtub for that specific application to elevate and create a waterproof bottom, like a bathtub concept for a specific application, such as a treatment plant and elevate that. Sure, you can apply that concept to that. But if you're thinking about a broad community-wide implementation, again, um, in some ways today in South Florida, we feel that uh, the response is really to, we can build seawalls, we can elevate them, we can protect property damage so that the economic value that is in our community is preserved. But at the same time, we're also going to have to adapt to living with water, let's say. Uh, So not necessarily just keeping it out of the top. So we're talking about barriers. And, you know, there's one school of thought that, you know, levees, dikes, berms, seawalls, you're interfering with nature, right? The sand gets replenished. But I still see developers developing these high-rise condominiums. They're still just as close as ever to the coastline. What do you want to say to those folks about potentially pulling back a little bit and not building quite so close? I totally agree with that statement. And actually, I Not that long ago, I brought that up with one of our regional government offices when there was a significant pollution event that took place due to coastal construction along our uh, bay waters. And, And unfortunately, we need more specific research with solid results and data that highlights the negative impacts of these type of activities 
uh, in order to initiate a change. That's a perfect segue for me to throw it back to Professor Wanless and ask you, Professor Wanless, why is it so hard to talk about the issue of climate change and sea level rise? If you're an elected official, your goal is to not lose your tax base. And if you start warning about impending inundation or coastal erosion or other risks, increased hurricane damage from storm, you know, higher storm surges, as sea level rises, you're, you're scaring your public. So the, the elected officials definitely don't want to do that. I live in Coral Gables, and a former mayor and diplomat, Jim, Jim Kaysen, while he was mayor and he just had it redone, he did a thing that you can find on the Coral Gables website and under their environmental stuff, you know, what cities should be doing to plan for sea level rise. And, and what, what it's really doing is, uh, which is interesting, is stating what the city should be doing to cover their tail because of sea level rise. Because if you buy a house or invest in a business or build a building and suddenly you can't sell it because of sea level rise, for whatever reason, it could be because of insurance or no mortgages available or whatever, you want to hold somebody to blame for letting you letting you live and build there and buy there. And it, it's a very good article and it recognizes it. But there are a few in South Florida, excellent leaders of the communities, mayors and such, that understand this and aren't afraid to talk about it. But usually it's because of they don't want to diminish the tax base. Are you saying that our public policymakers would bet rather be popular than right? No, they're trying to hold up their city's tax value. And, uh, oh, they want people to continue buying. But it almost seems potentially like a game of musical chairs. Well, you're absolutely right. This is... Uh, I, right now, ha- over half of, almost half of Miami-Dade County is less, six feet or less in elevation above sea level. And that sounds ridiculous, but that's what we've done. And we're very close because you have the king tides, the big tides on top of the regular high tides and so on. And um, anywhere that's like three feet above sea level is flooded fairly regularly now by the bigger tides and small storms and stuff so and we saw that over in in the west coast with hurricane ian how how vulnerable these areas are to to various levels of storm surge but we're very very close to having uh insurance skyrocket that may happen this year actually i have clients that have their insurance premiums right now as community associations professor over 100 150 percent increases and they're not all coastal they're even in and they'd much prefer to not insure us, and especially in the coastal area. And um, and mortgages, there are places in Miami-Dade County now where you can no longer get a 30-year mortgage. Well, that means my house, if you want to buy it on a mortgage, is probably only worth about half as much. Now, for the very high-end residences, well, people want it. They want to live there as long as they can. They'll pay whatever cash they can for it. But uh, we're very close to having... Some, some serious changes. This podcast is called Take It to the Board, and it's premised on, you know, everything that may be of interest or importance to people living in the millions of community associations around the world. Community, these, these condominium associations, cooperative associations, homeowners associations, they're operated by elected volunteer board members. So, you know, many of these association boards do have fairly broad authority under their documents to pass reasonable rules and, and, and restrictions. I want to ask you both. Is there anything that these association boards, whether it's a high-rise condo, mid-rise, a a homeowners association, is there anything these boards should be thinking about doing in terms of creating policies or passing rules that could help with the issues we're talking about today? I think the first rule is as sea level rises, the lower parts of the condominium below ground and above ground are going to be affected by seawater. And many of these buildings, the concrete is not, and the other things are really not designed to be infiltrated by seawater. So that's a huge concern to just have to do with the integrity of the building. Seawalls, from my point of view, by the way, are a fairly inexpensive way to get a couple of years of protection if the whole area does it or the whole condominium area is surrounded by a wall. It'll keep out the, the high tides, but as water levels rise, the porosity of, and permeability of our limestone means that it, nothing, nothing really will work without really sealing the base. 
of the whole unit. But I, I think the bigger problem is that there's no rule that if, if you buy into a house or a condominium that is vulnerable, there's no warning. You have this wonderful Iowa pig farmer, retired, wants to come down, live by the ocean and the sun and, and buy something for their children or grandchildren to enjoy. And uh, there's no warning that, that there's a good chance it won't be sellable within a mortgage cycle. I think that's the tragedy. And, and it's sort of build it, sell it, and we're out of here kind of thing. You're so correct on that. It's very short-term thinking. I mean, listen, I've had all sorts of people on the podcast. I had a real estate professional. And what she said is, they look, they're looking at this the view and the room layout. That's what they're looking at. They're not looking up to see if there's sprinklers. They're not asking about whether or not there's a generator or any of the other, you know, is the water pump functioning? Looking very short term, again, blinders on. Do I like the view from my unit? Do I like this layout? You're very correct, Professor, in as much as the seawall is often relegated way down the list in terms of repair and and improvement projects. You're much more likely to get people excited about uh, planting seasonal flowers, uh, redoing the lobby, buying new patio furniture. The seawall is often an afterthought, but if I'm hearing you correctly, it should definitely be moved up the priority list. It can be. And there's one island community in northern Biscayne Bay that they're fill, so they're low. And they designed them so the, the rain would flow into the road, down the road to a, an area where it goes to deep well injection. Okay, but sea level has risen, the, the communities have subsided a little bit. So the road's flooding regularly now. And the community wants them to raise the road. And they finally said, you raise your homes and we will raise the road. The cost, and this has to do with tax base and everything. They're worried people are going to leave and they're going to be stuck with an unpayable bill of, of raising the roads. So there, there are just so many questions with this. I had my partner, Katie Berkey, on talking about construction going up next door to existing development. Often they're, again, focusing on the view. How is that? Or maybe even the traffic, not thinking about the drainage issues that are going to be created by that new high rise going up next door. So we'll actually put that in the show notes. I wanted to ask, are either of you working with the Florida legislature, the governor's office, or Florida's congressional delegation on sea level rise? I am working with various regional governments and several of my colleagues as well from the point of creating opportunities through new innovative technologies that are emerging from research. How can we actually write them into codes or ordinances so that these HOAs and condo associations and property owners, uh, if they are going to actually go through and invest and rebuild a seawall, for example, that the new seawall that they built is more durable, can last longer without requiring repairs, it it has less environmental impacts, and um, at the same time, for example, perhaps can be incrementally uh, adjusted in height at a lower cost. Because as Dr. Wenless mentioned earlier, uh, you know, often if you don't provide a uniform response and you have a weak link somewhere, you know, the solution isn't going to be as effective. And yet, when we ask individual homeowners to build their seawalls because the seas are rising and their property is too low, not everyone is able to afford that expense at the same time. So if we can create opportunities the way the ordinances and codes that exist today uh, that enable stakeholders to incrementally respond and adapt or produce more durable seawalls, you know, that could definitely help the community along the way. So we're working with regional governments, cities, Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience, um, for example, as part of that offer for North Bay Village, did pass a new ordinance where they now approve fiber polymer reinforced seawall construction instead of a steel reinforcement because the steel often corrodes and cracks that develop as a result of that corrosion lead to more severe damage and failure of walls. Uh, So uh, to protect against that and extend life, fiber polymer reinforcement is now approved. Modular construction 
is now you know accepted and there are various options so we are working along those lines and in some ways we are received well in others um, you know showing it happening in one region can help pave the path for the next region but you mentioned working regionally are you getting support from the state and the and the federal government well indirectly because a lot of the federal and regional or or state level funding infrastructure funding opportunities that is handed to regional governments is for this purpose to improve coastal resilience so when we are creating solutions working with these regional examples and delivering solutions that include this type of response we are then indirectly working with federal level or state level agencies because funding is coming from them and they are approving we of course if they're providing the funding we have to submit what solution we are delivering using this funding uh, so jointly with regional governments that is conveyed back to state level and federal level has that been a struggle professor you know this the struggle is really often comes from permitting perspective because often what has not been tried before and it's new it's not in the codes and uh at times we have to push the boundaries a bit whether it's from environmental law perspective or uh, ecological perspectives or regional resource management perspective so that is usually the toughest stickiest point but we actually have I'm proud to say that uh, as University of Miami we have three pilot project examples of these solutions that are fully permitted and one of them is fully installed uh, offshore in Miami Beach another one is partially installed in Broward County installation is ongoing uh in the Pompano Beach area and a third one is intended to start construction um sometime probably late May or early June in North Bay Village so permitting has taken place so we are getting cooperation and participation and we would love to see this scale up on this issue sea level rise whenever you we start doing a little research you always read about the dutch engineers other european engineers australian engineers are you both working with your counterparts internationally yes we are definitely following each other's work and uh you know uh, presenting in conferences and events and workshops uh you know hearing each other learning from each other and we are also in discussions uh with for example counterparts from the middle east as well as asia and australia who have done some of this work and want to also deploy pilot projects in in communities and one thing we're finding is that the this permitting or deployment opportunities the regulatory framework across the globe varies significantly so those collaborations are very useful because what we're not able to do here in the US for example because of our you know legislator uh, or regulatory framework may be able to be more easily done in another part of the world for the same application and if we can demonstrate success in a different region that kind of eases the path for bringing it home here so uh, those type collaborations are very fruitful so professor wanless we talk a lot about you know what's the government doing to address sea level rise what's the private corporate sector doing this is all going to impact their bottom line as well it is i think a lot of corporate entities aren't really thinking while they're purchasing major properties that are on low-lying areas or on coastlines or on barrier islands. I think the thing that concerns me most, I gave a statement earlier that we could be possibly at 6 feet of further sea level rise within 50 years. That totally overwhelms all the barrier islands of the world. And with 2 feet of sea level rise along the Atlantic and Gulf coast, the barrier island if it can re-equilibrate by migrating landward would probably be 2000 feet or more landward well you take a place like Miami Beach or any of the other barrier islands that means that everything on the the front couple thousand feet is sitting out in the ocean that kind of thing is already happening on the outer banks in north carolina and there are sort of three solutions to trying to get hold of of this erosion this loss one of them is building 
solid structures, seawalls and so on, all the other names you mentioned. Another one is trying to have things like mangroves and so on flourish and build the substrate upward with sea level rise. The third one is sand, putting new sand on the beach. And the problem is, and that's become unbelievably expensive, and it's what it, we're still doing as a way to, well, we have a beach erosion problem, we'll add sand. And it, it with this sea level rise, it's, it, it won't work because you not only have to do the top, you have to do the, the whole slope out in front of it. And so these are all things that if you look at the reality, again, let's just say we have six feet coming in the next 50 years, you know, and it's basically the same thing if it's coming in the next 100 years, that we have to start thinking about something different. Even sea walls or walls of any kind aren't really going to make a, a place for Miami Beach to live or Miami to be with, with these kind of Rise. So worst case scenario, if the forecast model is six feet rise in 50 years, and you mentioned all these barrier islands are basically going to be underwater, is there any way to prevent that? Or is it just inevitable that we're going to lose barrier islands? They will no longer be inhabitable if it's the worst case scenario here. Well, I don't know if that's the worst case scenario, but in that scenario, we don't know how fast sea level can rise, how fast ice can melt, but we know from the past it can be ridiculously fast. And we have dramatically increased the levels of CO2 that we haven't seen for several million years. So we don't know how fast ice will respond, but it is starting to respond. With that kind of, of rate, there, we should be worried about relocation and things like that and doing the little things to make life possible where we are while we can. By the way, we have a lot of older people in Miami-Dade County that are aware and have their nest egg in their house. They're selling and they're renting, something we never thought about when we were kids. We were told buy, beg, and steal to get the down payment for a house. We have many young people here that are in very good jobs, but they're not buying. They think the risk is too great. They don't think that's where their nest egg should be focused. Can you tell me something optimistic? <laughs> This is part of, so so for some people, and I asked you earlier on in the episode, why is it so difficult to have this conversation? For people who are listening and they, and they agree with what you're saying, and I'm not talking about people who just deny the science behind all of this, but for people who get it and it's just too scary to even contemplate and it feels as if, you know, we're on a roller coaster and we can't get off. How do you give them any sort of assurance that there are potentially options right now we're probably in for at least a 20 meter 70 foot rise of sea level at some point and that could well be this century or the next that's that's mind-blowing if we don't stop our co2 buildup it's going to be more and more and more and while people might now migrate in florida to orlando maybe that's going to be a problem in the future you know if we don't get hold of this i have a map a series of maps on the wall that a, a former student did looking at peninsular Florida with from now up to 24 feet of sea level rise. Everywhere we live, except Orlando and part of Tampa, is basically gone. Professor Wallace, you're not going to be invited to sit on the tourism board anytime soon. <laughs> Just, in all seriousness, you've been speaking about this since 1981. Do you feel like people have not been listening to you? No, they're listening now. And you know what? I can go to a very conservative, wealthy community where there are very wonderful houses on barrier islands, and I give a talk, and the people come up who are, again, very conservative, and they say, you know, you're not telling us anything we don't know. We've watched this happen. There had been a very significant rise of sea level in the last 15 years in South Florida, and it's one that, that you can see. And if you live on Key Biscayne or anywhere up the coast, you're seeing Parts of the island that never used to flood, flood with increasing frequency. And, uh, and also rainwater drains away more slowly because there's no slope. This is not just a South Florida issue. No. This could be Charleston. This could be New Orleans. This Charleston's could... more vulnerable than we are. And their, their land is sinking at a faster rate than ours. Miami has probably because of changing speed of the Gulf Stream and what's called a redistribution of mass that we're, we have a probably maybe a 50 percent greater rate of sea level rise than the global average coming up. So 
all these areas are are going to be severely affected one way or another. And uh, the only place that isn't going to be as affected is around Greenland, where as the ice melts, there's less mass and the water is not pulled toward it, the ocean. So it's receding. And um, even you were, there, you were in Greenland in 2013. Have you been back since? No, I was there in 2012 and 2013. It was I give, as you pointed out, a lot of talks about climate change and sea level rise, and I figured I'd better go. I'm too old to go mess around in Antarctica, but at least you can go to Greenland. It's an amazing place to visit. But I wanted to get out on the ice sheet. And the, the most amazing thing when you go there is that you see so many things that are accelerating the ice melt. As the ice melts, all the Gobi Desert dust and the black soot and the brown soot that's in the ice is concentrated on the melting surface. That makes it darker. That absorbs more heat. There, there are all these accelerating feedback that are really speeding it up. And I really wanted to get there. I saw that black carbon. I was in uh, Patagonia. Saw was yeah. looking at Perito Moreno right before the world shut down with the pandemic. I, I did want to ask you both about that, that pause in carbon emissions. It must have produced some sort of significant data because, we, you know, the world kind of shut down for a little bit. Have you used any of that data in your research? No, but I use it in my courses, I pointed out. But it's like a little blip in an overall rising problem. And, uh, you know, it did slow down the, the input of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid, all the, you know, sulfur dioxide, all these things that were tough on our planet for a little while. But now we're getting back to normal. Though I think compliments of Zoom, there are an awful lot of businesses that aren't wasting their own money now to travel people around the world when we can do it like this. I actually think that's significant. The reduction in business travel, you know, corporations are looking at it from a financial aspect naturally, but from an environmental aspect, you don't have people flying around as much. Professor Adaraglu, how engaged are your students on this topic? Students are very engaged, actually, and we do integrate this topic at least in one teaching module, but often more, just about in every course as a real life example of, you know, challenges that we're living with, facing at a global scale. So students are very much connected to this topic, very intrigued, fascinated, and studying it from, you know, various dimensions, all the way from communication to management of resources to, um, you know, integrating it into their life planning or career paths. And, um, and, and really, it opened the door quite a bit on interdisciplinary education, both uh, for us engaged in teaching, as well as for our students on the receiving end, because often this topic is not just a single discipline topic. It involves a multitude of disciplines and and perspectives. And uh, so students, at least are our hope that with the level of engagement, the passion, the interest, the interdisciplinary training that they're receiving, that will bring on more solutions or active responses uh, to these challenges in the decades ahead. And you asked earlier, what is the hope? So in some ways, our next generation is is our hope when it comes to uh, how do we manage sea level rise and climate change? Well, let me build on that. So we've been all been re- reading a lot about chat GBT recently. I even went on and asked chat GBT how to get good people to serve on an HOA board. And in 60 seconds, it spit out a, a pretty good Pretty good response to that question. Is there any uh, is there any talk right now? I imagine there is about how we can use artificial intelligence to help come up with some solutions. Absolutely, and we're doing that. I mean, I have several colleagues. Uh, we're all engaged in research. Where you know, you ask often, how do you convince people, or are, or are people believing? sea level rise and climate change impacts today and planning ahead. And uh, AI is that tool really enabling us to model examples of solutions or challenges or scale them up and put them on a quantifiable 
you know, chart uh, that can be visual or create images that shows what, um, you know, our environment, you know, Dr. Van Les noted, for example, uh, what will happen to Florida in the decades ahead, where all the way up to Orlando, we may be underwater. So that level of visualization and modeling is all developed through those resources, AI. This problem doesn't just, is not contained just by flood control, because, you know, our everyday lives, like heat, how do we manage increasing heat? Uh, How do we maintain thermal comfort? How do we remain well and healthy in this environment? What kind of food can we produce in this environment? In in, in this environment, how do we meet our nutritional needs? And what, how are we managing our water resources, energy resources? And so it's not just raising the building, raising the wall height and raising the streets, but how do we manage and who can manage under what circumstances or terms? A lot of this can be modeled, framed, and visualized and communicated. I want to thank you both. I'm going to wrap up here. Professor Wallace, I want to go back to you. So I'm speaking to you from Los Angeles. Uh, I'm out in New York City, two of the most populous cities in the country. Those cities also are impacted by sea level rise, correct? Yes, absolutely. Right. You know, you know. I think one of the most interesting cities is Boston. It's it's hilly and you drive around, but it's actually a series of islands connected together by Phil, just like Miami or anywhere else. I've been to Mumbai. It's some high land connected to a barrier island and a marsh, and it all looks nice, but it's unbelievably vulnerable. Shanghai is just like New Orleans on a delta. So, And we, we have hundreds of millions of people that are at imminent risk for, for having to be relocated on, a, on an earth that's pretty full. Stockholm um, is a series of islands as well. St. Petersburg, Russia, also islands. Yes. I'd like to say one other thing is that we wonder why we're having this increasing problem. I was born in 1942. There were just less than 2 billion people on the planet. Last summer, we went over 8 billion. There are four times the number of people. And we're not really being more extravagant in our use of fossil fuels than we were in the 50s. There's just a lot more of us. And uh, so this is a, a two-pronged problem. It's getting hold of the energy, solving the, the livability problems or relocating. But it, it's also getting getting hold of this population problem, which we're not allowed to talk about. Well, it's interesting you say that because China reversed its policy on that. So any any final thoughts and some resources for our listeners who want to be better educated on this topic? Talk to one another and especially... Younger generation, talk with older generation, talk with grandparents, those who doubt, you know, climate change impacts, sea level rise, frequent flood events, uh, speak to your grandparents and uh, reflect on their experience on these topics and participate in as much, uh, as many opportunities or community workshops uh, workshops or, or webinars, seminars that are offered uh, around you to better understand and expose yourself, embed yourself, and just participate at some level. I always take that question toward the college kids and the high school kids. You've got to understand this whole thing very well, because if you do, whatever you're interested in, you can make an unbelievable difference for life on earth, whether you're in engineering or architecture, anything, and uh, understand it well, and you will set your life out to make a difference. If you go into law to manage coastal residences as they are, you'll lose out. But if you realize there are all kinds of major legal things coming up as, as areas get inundated about rights here and rights on higher ground, that you know, you're going to have a very meaningful life and, and make a big contribution. I really wish I was 20 again, but I, I sort of missed that boat. I wish you were 20 again, too. We need you. I want to thank you both for joining me today. This was an incredibly important topic. And, and just be well and continue doing the good work you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to follow and rate us on your favorite podcast platform or visit TakeItToTheBoard.com for more ways to connect.